the morning. No, there's no one in there. <laughs> there's just something about red, isn't it? <laughs> for those of you who are tuning in online, thank you for joining us. And for those of you who are in person, visitors and members, welcome. It is good for us to be together on such a cool morning to worship together. Our service is in the bulletin. Everything should be in there as I understand it. So please rise for the confession and the forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, Together, let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven, and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Good morning. Good morning. Louder. Okay. Uh, the first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks. strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it all the break of day. The nations rage, and the kingdom shake. God speaks, and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord. What desolations God has brought upon the earth. Behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world. Who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The second reading is from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove, it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Resurrection comes from the eighth chapter of St. John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. going to be an academic, you were taught, and you wrote in Latin. So that's what I did. I had to go away from my town and live with another family for high school. And then I went on to the University of Erfurt, where I earned both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and on to law school. That's what Hans, my father, wanted me to do. It would help bring money to the family. But you know, I didn't want to be a lawyer. So I decided to go home and tell them, my parents, Hans and Margarita, my father was furious. He said I had no choice. I had to go back and be a lawyer. So on my way back to school, there was a terrible storm, a terrible thunderstorm. And I'm walking through the forest, and the lightning is striking all around me. And I fell down on my knees, and I prayed to St. Dan, because then I was Catholic and we had to pray to the saints and ask her to save me. And if she did, I would give my life to the church and be a monk. 
Well, she did, and obviously I became the monk. And interestingly enough, there are a couple people right here today that have seen the actual spot where I fell on my knees and prayed to St. Anne. So, there I am, studying to be a monk and learning more and more, but I never felt good enough. I always felt like I couldn't do enough to earn God's love. It didn't matter what I did. I didn't know what to do. So I had my mentor, John Stolpitz, and he talked to me and he said, you need to look closer in the Holy Scripture, particularly at the book of Romans. And there it was. There it was, right there in the book of Romans, that I was saved by grace, an unearned gift. God loved me and saved me no matter what. I believe you just heard that read, that very passage. Well, that was very freeing. And then I looked at things in the Catholic Church and thought, well, there are some problems here, like the sale of indulgences to buy your way into heaven. And people were very poor and couldn't afford them, and the church was getting very rich with that. And that the Pope was the end-all, be-all, not the scripture. And, um, well, the list goes on. Praying to saints. You couldn't read the Bible because it had to be in Latin or Greek. I thought these things needed to change. So, on October 31st of 1715, I posted the infamous 95 Thesis on the door of the church, the castle church in Wittenberg. Well, the printing press had been invented. People tore them down, translated them into German, because after all, they were in Latin, and they were disseminated throughout the region. Well, then there were some problems. The Catholic Church was a little annoyed. We had to have a big meeting called the Diet of Worms, which doesn't mean you ate worms. It was the town, and a diet is a kind of a trial meeting. And they said I was a heretic, and they wanted me to take back my words. And I said, nope, not at all. I'm not going to do it. Here I stand. I can do no other. So then they put a price on my head. And friends of mine kidnapped me and helped, hid me in Wartburg Castle, where I continued to write and write, uh, translate the Bible into German. I wrote letters and to friends and so on. Well, again, my writings got out there, and they were printed, and they went around the region. They went all the way to a little town called Nimschen, where there was a convent. And in that convent were 12, well, there were many nuns, but 12 in particular young nuns. They were not happy with life in the convent. They didn't think it was what they wanted. And they were discussing what they read. And they thought, hmm, we'd like to meet this, this Dr. Martin Luther. So those nuns wrote to me. And I arranged for them to come to Wittenberg. A friend of mine was a fishmonger, and he would deliver fish to, the, to that convent regularly. Well, after his delivery of fish one day, 12 little nuns crawled into those fish barrels and they came back to Wittenberg. And we found places for them to live throughout the town. 11 of those nuns found we got married and taken care of, but doggone, there was that 12th nun. Her name was Katharina von Bora. She didn't like any of the suitors, and she'd been in the convent since she was five. Finally, she told a friend she wanted to marry me. So, Katharina and I married. Ah, oh, my Katie. She was quite young. She was only 26, and I was 41. But I want to tell you about the things that my Katie did. My Katie kept our household. She grew vegetables and fruits. She was a beekeeper. She also raised horses. She got a license to be a brewer. And oh, did she make the finest beer. Oh, I could have one of those beers right now. Oh, it was delicious. 
And that's how she helped make money and keep our household running. And believe me, I was a disaster with finance. It was Katie who kept us going. And I turned all of that over to her, which was odd for the day, because after all, I was the man. I was the head of the house, but not in the Luther household. We were helpmates. We helped each other. We had six children, and we adopted another four. When one of our children died, I was despondent. I hid in a room in my study for days and days. Finally, Katie pounded on the door and said, Martin, did God die? Well, I said no. And we talked about it, and that helped me get out of that terrible, terrible darkness that I was in. Katie was always there. She put up with a lot. Believe me, since I was a lecturer and I was traveling around and I was writing and so on, people came to our house. They came for meals, they came to stay. Sometimes we had boarders, but Katie never minded. She was always glad to have them. We had table talks at night and we would sit around our table and Katie would bring out food and we would discuss theology and various things within the church. And Katie participated. Why? Because Katie was my equal. She was my helpmate. Katie had been in the convent. She had studied the Bible. She was also somewhat assertive. And I was glad she was there. Always there, always at my side was Katie. She was what kept our family going and what helped this church become what it is because she was always there. She was my morning star of Wittenberg. She rose with the sun and watched, rose with the sun and watched over us all day, just as the stars are always in the sky, whether we see them or not. That was my Katie. And that's who I wanted to tell you about today, was my Katie. Amen. Let us have a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, today, here at St. John's Lutheran Church and in Lutheran churches around the world, we are celebrating the Reformation. But it is your word that led to that Reformation. Help us always remember your word that you love us no matter what, and nothing can separate us from that love. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You ever stop and think about the future? Wonder what the future's going to hold? Ponder how it's going to play out? The future? Well, if you look on the internet, you can find all kinds of things. I don't know how accurate they are, but you can find all kinds of things about the future. If you're uh, sitting there squirming now, you could probably be thinking that uh, I'm going to talk about the future in the money-needing sort of way. Or perhaps you think if she's going to talk about the future, she's going to talk about the need for more people sort of kind of way. But, but let's look at the future as doom and gloom, as some sort of prepper where we could turn the basement into a bunker and get ready for the end kind of future. All of those are futures, right? What about your vision of the future? Do you have one? All that stuff on the internet if you do a Google search like I did this week, you'll see that there was a 20, 2011 movie titled The Future. 
I want to say it's in the past now, but 2011 was a while back. So, And then Harvard Business Review had an article on leadership in uncertain times, and it was titled, Learning from the Future, How to Make Robust Strategy in Times of Deep Uncertainty. And then there's a website called Big Think that has an article about the future, and it even uses our understanding of free will in an article. So I might have to read that one of these days. And then there's the self-help section where you can find all kinds of things. And then I had to laugh. Five steps to creating your vision for the future. And it starts out, if you feel a little bogged down by the past and overwhelmed by what is to come, then here are the essential steps to bring you closer to creating your vision for the future. Hmm. So I looked at those five steps. Reframe your mindset. And the theory behind this is that you have two different mindsets in your ability. One is that you either encounter new things as something to be afraid of or something that you can use as opportunity. And so in some ways, this article was saying, just change your mindset. That's easy, right? We can do that. I'm a different person. Number two. Recalculate your expectations. <laughs> this one uh, said, it is essential for you to shed your baggage. And we all know how easy it is, is to just drop luggage, right? Not so easy. But it said it's difficult to have a clear sense of the future if you don't drop that baggage and you expect people to be different. Now, I get a sense of expecting people to be different. The third category in this article was discover your core values. And I actually find some value in this one because I think finding your core values are the things that define who I am. And I can't lose sight of that, who you are. What are your core values? So that one made sense to me. Four is define your mission. Simply put, it's standing on those core values. What will you give? What will you take? How will you stand on those values? And five is that you design a vision for the future, that you're intentional and that you're authentic about what you want next. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't always know what I want next. I don't always know what choices I have, or what building blocks or stumbling blocks are going to be in my way to have that. But this article about the future, which told me just to adjust my focus and make choices about the future so that I can have the future I want, kind of stung me a bit, as if I were in control. And I started to think, I guess on a basic level, I could argue, I, I could agree with some of this thinking. Because if you think about it, how one approaches the future can be determined by your attitude. That's true. But my issue with this article says that I'm in control and that I can decide and I can determine where my future will be. I'm not convinced that that's an accurate stance. None of us looks at the future the same way. And especially if I were to ask you today how you look at the future of the church, you would probably have a variety of different answers. Just by me saying the words, what is the future of the church, that brings to you its own kind of fear, doesn't it? Just to our thinking, rational, Emotional, fears surge in all of that when the topic of the future and the church arises. Well, just look at the time of the year with the annual budget coming out, with all the fear gathered around that. Will we make it another year? Will we be around for our 225th? Can we keep these buildings safe? 
Will people return or come? Fear, expectations, mission, vision. So perhaps, maybe, the article is right, that we can control what we want out of this future. Think for a moment with me, though. Think about Father Martin standing on that front step, nailing those 95 theses on that front door. Did he have any idea what he was starting? Was he concerned for the future of the church? Do you ever think he imagined the effect that he would have? As that article above shared, do you think that Luther recalibrated his expectations? Do you think that Luther reframed his mindset? I do believe that he could define his core values, and I believe he did over and over again. By posting those theses on the castle door, he redefined something that was lost. Luther wanted to reconnect the church to the scriptures, not to kings or kingdoms, not to that of state church where government is in our, you know, government controls the country, not to individuals who are self-determined and how to live or, or, or individuals who were telling people how to live, not to popes, not to rulers over the church. But Luther wanted to return the church to the scriptures. He wanted the church to understand God and God's love through the person of Jesus Christ. We know this story Luther, by wanting to reform the church, was not calling it to something new. All those reformers, including Father Martin, wanted the church to return to the teaching of the Bible, especially to the teachings of St. Paul that had been obscured or ignored by the church of that day. You see, there were some as Priscilla, as Father Martin had shared with us, there were some who believed and taught that they could, through their own work, gain their own freedom. If you only recalculated your expectations and reframed your mindset, you could do it by your own efforts, and you could free yourself from sin. By your own efforts. And yet, we really know that story to be a story about slavery. For one can never be free. One cannot do enough or strive to accomplish enough. Nothing through which we humans do could fully commit or earnestly endeavor. Nothing could accomplish that freedom. It was only the divine work of Jesus Christ it was only Jesus who could do the job. There's still nobody in there, by the way. Jesus is the one who saves us at the cross. And we know this to be grace. And that is where true freedom is won. It is earned by him, not by us. And we receive it as gift. So on that day... Standing at that door, think about it with me, Luther was attempting to recover something. What they were endeavoring to recoup was the core message in Romans that we've summarized as justification. St. Paul says it in the third chapter, verse 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You see, if you look closely at the first and second chapters in the book of Romans, St. Paul, acting like a persecuting attorney, argues that all of us are guilty in God's sight. And according to the requirements of God's law, every one of us is accused and convicted. And every one of us receives a sentence of death because not a one of us can measure up 
and not a one of us can do it by ourselves. So St. Paul, being that prosecutor, sums up the case against us in verse 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's what the law does. So our age-old tendency to justify ourselves, whether in the 16th century of Luther's day or today in our 21st century, is a reminder that the church must always be reforming. We must always look to the future, but with backward eyes. Because to be reforming is really about seeking the future by going back to the fundamentals, the basics, the original, if you will. And Jesus says it in John 8, 31. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth and freedom. Luther's hope was that the church would be connected and would remain connected for the rest of its life to Jesus' word. There does not need to be any newfangled adventures or any additions that need to be made. It doesn't need to be made more complicated than it is. One does not need to alter it in any fashion. Just remain connected to the word of God. Friends, on this Reformation Day, as we re remember Father Martin, his bold act of nailing articles for debate on the door, we need to remember that he wanted the church to proclaim the truth, the truth that frees from sin and death, the truth that is so secure that it can lead into our future, the future. If you continue in my word, the Gospel of John says, and Luther envisioned the church as a people who were focused upon the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word, John tells us in the first chapter, the word was with God and the word was God. And John tells us that the second person of the Godhead was with God at the beginning of creation. So Luther wanted the church to get back to the essentials, to know the word of God, to appreciate the scriptures, to understand their intention, to study the word of God and dig into it and ask questions, and be, get e e explanations from it, and wrestle with it. For it is in doing these things with the word of God that God will reveal God's self to us. Now Luther also wrote these memorable words in the small, card, small called articles. Thank God that even a seven-year-old child knows what the church is. Namely, the church is holy believers, Sheep hear, who hear the voice of their shepherd. If you continue in my word, Jesus says, you will hear the voice of our shepherd. You see, Luther understood the church was not a building, but it was people who studied and focused on the word, and the word being Jesus, the good shepherd. So in reading scripture, we hear the voice of our shepherd. And Luther and the reformers were looking ahead by looking backwards, back to the gospel where we, each of us, have been deemed worthy by Christ. So we are free to live. I guess the question becomes on this Sunday of reforming is are we a people of the word? I think it's a fair question. Are we guided solely by God's word in the Holy Scriptures? Because today is simply not just about talking about a German monk who nailed a document in the 16th century to a door. 
Today is not about singing our Lutheran heritage anthems with gusto. It's not about a, pri a point of pride in looking at that historical heritage that we talk about. Today's celebration is about rejoicing in truth and freedom, dwelling on and in the word of God, Jesus the Christ, receiving him as he comes to us in his holy supper according to his word, to give thanks for the waters of baptism where it is we are washed clean and made God's people, his children, according to his word. We are people of freedom, disciples who live in the words of Jesus, who sets us and others free. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the heart of our Reformation. That's the heart of our scriptures. It's the very heart of our gospel. And I believe it shows us the heart of God. Reform us, dear God. Reform us. Amen. Please rise. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. God, our fortress, we pray for your church. Write your law of love onto our hearts and the hearts of all your people, that we may remain steadfast in our witness to your grace. Hear us, O oh God. God, our liberator, we pray for your earth. Bring new life to overused land and, contain, and contaminated rivers. Reform and reorient our relationship with the environment that we may faithfully care for all in your creation. Hear us, O God. God, our refuge and our strength, we pray for the nations. Where they are in uproar, bring wise leadership and comfort for those in distress. Make wars to cease and peace to enter every land. 
Hear us, O oh God. God, who is our very present help in trouble, we pray for all those who have any need. Show mercy to refugees and all fleeing from danger. Shelter any without homes. Calm all who are facing illness, surgery, or new diagnosis. Hear us, O oh God. God, our Redeemer, we pray for this congregation. And we ask that you bless all who are preparing for baptism or affirmation of baptism. That you open everyone's hearts to your Holy Spirit. That you teach us your word and give us courage to proclaim your faith. The faith that we believe in. Hear us, O oh God. God, our stronghold, we give thanks for those who have gone before us in the faith especially Martin Luther and Katie and all the reformers, renew and reform us as we strive to continue in your word. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and our silent prayers to you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also be with you. Let us share together the peace of Christ with one another.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need. Through Jesus Christ, who, sits a t who sets a table for everyone. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, lover of creation, we give you thanks and praise. For on the ocean of your steadfast love you bear us and you place the song of your spirit in our hearts. When we turn from your love and defile the earth, you do not abandon us. Your spirit speaks through Huda and Micah, through prophets and sages and saints in every age to confront our sin and to reveal the vision of your new creation. Joining in the song of the universe, we proclaim your glory singing. the Christ to share our fragile humanity through Jesus's life death and resurrection you open the path from brokenness to health from fear to trust from pride and conceit to reverence for you rejected by the world that could not bear the gospel of life Jesus knew death was near his head anointed by for burial by an unknown woman Jesus gathered together all who loved him he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to everyone, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. Whoever, wherever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And now, as we gather at this table in response to his commandment to share this bread of cup and this cup of Christ's undying love, we proclaim our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Breathe your Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the universe upon these gifts that we bring to you, this bread, this cup, ourselves, our souls, and our bodies, that we may be signs of your love for the whole world and ministers of your transforming purpose. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, creator of all. We bless your holy name forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ invites you to this table. Come, taste, see.
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith and in hope and in love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
that, and that, that you folks are so loud that you drown out the organ. So let's sing it loud by the last verse. At, uh, at least the part of the chapter. <laughs>